loudest speaker, chairs, and the wonderful audience in different parts of the world, welcome to the SNS webinar. The speaker for the first session of today is our distinguished uh, faculty from Canada, Professor Ashish Kumar. Professor Kumar is an as assistant professor of neurosurgery from the Center of Cerebral Vascular Cerebral Endos Endovascular Neurosurgery, Sunbrook Health Sciences uh, Center of University of Tor Toronto, Canada, Ontario. He was the past fellow at the Fujita Health University as well as University of Toronto, Canada. He is the fellowship director of the Advanced Micro Neurosurgery at his institution and is also the wife, vice chair of the Inclusion and Diversity Division of Neurosurgery. He is part of several novel uh, projects in his institution, institution which are contributions to the development of professional practices. Education scholar program in 2020 to 2022 and creative professional activity at Sunbrook Neurovascular Pilot Project, which are aimed to create quality educators as well as quality education in neurosurgery. He won the Peter Bond uh, teaching award for the uh, teacher last year. He is a hybrid neurosurgeon who specializes in the management of aneurysm and other cerebral diseases. He is a third author for a public in various peer review journal. We are extremely honored to have him at our webinar today, and he'll be talking about management of hyperacute stroke. The speaker for the second session today in our webinar is honored guest from China, Professor Jun Feng Lu. Professor Lu is a consultant neurosurgeon at the Department of Neurosurgery, Huasan Hospital, Fudan University. He's also the Deputy Director of Brain Function Laboratory, Brain Institute of Fudan University, Shanghai, China. His clinical interests are focused upon the treatment of adults with brain tumors. He specializes in advanced brain mapping method to preserve crucial area for speech and motor functions in the brain. His research interest focuses on the brain mechanism for speech. We are extremely honored to have him today at our webinar, and he will be talking about language mapping in glioma surgery. The chair for the first session of today's webinar is our distinguished senior faculty from Canada, Professor Timo Krings. Professor Krings is the professor of radiology and surgery and the chief of the radiology at the Toronto Western Hospital and head of the Division of Diagnostic and Intervention Neuroradiology at the University Health Network, Mount Sinai, and the Women's College Hospitals. He holds the David Bradley and Nancy Garden uh, chairs in interventional uh, neuroradiology at the University of Toronto. Focusing his research effort on imaging and treatment of neurovascular diseases, Dr. Craig has published more than 420 peer review articles and approximately 30 book chapters and four books of spine, pediatric and intervention neuroradiology, and neurovascular anatomy. Dr. Craig's Leadership in the field of neuroradiology is bolstered by his distinguished grants and awards, including the Scientific Award of European Society of Neuroradiology, the Lucin uh, Epi uh, Prize, and the Founder Award in the Interventional Neuroradiology Radiology of the ESNR. We are so grateful to have Professor Kring for accepting our invitation to be the chair of our uh, uh, first session of our Professor uh, Ashikuma. The chair for the second session of today's webinar is our honored guest from Taiwan, Professor Ku Ting Chen. Professor Chen is an associate professor in the Department of Neurosurgery at the Changguang Memory Hospital, Linko, Taiwan. His clinical interests are focused in the management of glioma, awake surgery, pain intervention, and normal pressure hydrocephalus. He has received several awards and honors for his distinguished contribution towards neurosurgery in his country. He's a noted author with several publications in various peer review journals. We are extremely thankful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Jung Feng Lu. On behalf of the Education Committee of the SNS and President Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome both speakers and chairs and the audiences to this online platform of SNS webinar. Uh, a warm welcome to our colleague from China, and we are extremely thankful to Professor uh, Zubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. Uh, with that introduction, I would like to hand over the online podium to our first chair, Professor Timo Krings. Professor, please. Thank you very much for this uh, exhaustive and uh, very kind introduction to uh, all the speakers uh, and chairs. 
Um, I uh, would first like to extend my gratitude uh, to you, to uh, Professor Raja and Professor Kato for organizing these extremely educational events uh, that are broadcast around the world. I think uh, in our day and age uh, where we need to get uh, together rather than separate, it is really important uh, that we do these types of educational experiences. It is my great pleasure to introduce uh, now Professor Ashish Kumar from uh, the uh, University of Toronto, uh, actually a, a close friend and colleague uh, of mine, uh, as we are working just across the street from each other, more or less. Uh, he's at uh, Sunnybrook Health Sciences, uh, one of the major hubs for neurovascular uh, diseases, and he uh, has the privilege of being dual trained, both in open vascular and in endovascular uh, neurosurgery, which is, uh, I think, a privilege that uh, showcases not only his uh, uh, great expertise in uh, the field, but also having a more holistic approach on neurovascular diseases, not only focusing on one aspect, but focusing also on the surgical aspects. His publication list uh, highlights uh, this dual training as uh, he has published major articles on uh, looking at, for example, uh, treatment, surgical treatment, open vascular treatment after endovascular treatment and looking at the operative nuances uh, uh, in this. Um, Dr. K uh, Professor Kumar is an uh, amazing teacher. In fact, he, uh, he is, uh, uh, is in charge now of uh, the neurosurgical uh, training and uh, teaching of uh, residents uh, and fellows and has established a curriculum that encompasses not only the open aspects, but also the endovascular aspects. And for this, uh, all of our residents and fellows are extremely grateful. His talk will be today on uh, the acute management uh, of stroke. And as we all know, uh, this has uh, truly changed over the last 10, 15 years. When I started my career, uh, the endovascular stroke treatment uh, was uh, characterized by five minutes of rush getting into the vessel and then two hours of waiting, crossing our fingers that the intraarterial TPA would work. Now it's uh, quite different as he will uh, describe. And it's one of the most uh, gratifying types of treatment uh, that we as endovascular neurosurgeons and interventional neuroradiologists are able to do, as we can sometimes see the effects of our treatment right there on the table. And uh, Professor Kumar, Kumar has an uh, like extremely large experience on uh, the treatment of endovascular stroke. So we will be uh, privileged to have the now uh, opportunity to have uh, Professor Kumar speak about acute management of stroke. Thank you very much, Ashish, for uh, accepting our invitation, and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Professor Krings, and uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Liu. I was, uh, when I knew, knew that uh, Professor Krings will be chairing this session, I was thinking many of the things which I'm going to talk about today is, is probably, you know, uh, the guidelines were made by him. Uh, he has this vast experience uh, in, in endovascular uh, treatment of cerebrovascular diseases. Uh, and I think he is one of the pioneers who have, who have revolutionized uh, the endovascular treatment. I'll not say just in uh, North America, but all over the world. And if you go back to you know, previous articles, uh, you, will, you will find his, uh, his name in uh, his footprint in every major intervention or, or uh, 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 management strategy guidelines which have been developed all over the world. So, um, and, and I actually invited him uh, to speak to our, in our neurosurgical curriculum lecture series uh, last year uh, as, as distinguished speaker. And, and, and he had almost like 25 topics on which you can choose which, which topic to choose to, to talk on. So that's his expertise. And, and it's my privilege actually that that uh, um, he's he's chairing this session so he can add his own expertise and his own fine nuances um, as a senior uh, 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 neurointerventionalist uh, and his experience will be will be vital. So uh, I'll I'll just uh, uh, give you I will just share the screen now, and I will just first go over uh, the the outline for today. So first of all, thank you so much, Dr. Liu and Professor Kato. 
uh, and Professor Kring to be uh, to be here today on a Saturday morning and uh, inviting me to talk on hyperacute treatment of stroke. I will be major, like uh, as as Dr. Kring said, I will be uh, mainly concentrating on uh, the endovascular part of it because that's what the, uh, my expertise uh, is. Uh, but I will be going through um, through an uh, introduction first, where we will probably uh, speak about some terminologies which we are going to use uh, throughout the throughout the uh, lecture. Then we'll talk about learning objectives from today's uh, uh, session. We will then speak about some epidemiology regarding stroke burden and how it's going to predict uh, how it's how it's how it's going to pan out in future in the next few years and why it it, it, it needs to be tackled the way it is being tackled right now then we will uh, head out and he will we will actually speak about some general clinical information regarding stroke and how to identify stroke that will be very brief and then we will speak about how to manage an acute uh, stroke patient if it comes to your hospital this will include neurology assessment radiology assessment and, and we will look after, uh, we'll look out for some terms which we often use while uh, making a decision on that. Um, I, I do appreciate that there are a lot of neurosurgeons who are uh, not doing this treatment currently, but I'm, I've seen an interest in, in, in being, uh, you know, dual trained in neurosurgery. So I'll make, uh, I'll keep this talk a little bit less complex and simple in terms. Um, and, and then, um, we will also speak about decision making so that we know that okay which are the cases where we need to do the endovascular treatment and which are the cases where we don't need to do endovascular treatment so uh, that's i think the key essential part and then we will also go through you know the role of tpa in in large vessel occlusion stroke uh, or if 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 there are uh, you know uh, vessel occlusion in major arteries uh, like an mca or aca in in m1 or a1 segment whether there is any data regarding the use of tpa and then we'll go through some case studies uh, where we did some cases uh, where we, I, I call them as pushing the envelope, uh, where we, we, we took some risks and we did something which is probably offline, but it, it, it helped the patient overall. So we'll go through those specific cases and then we'll, at the end, we will just see what's in future uh, for endovascular treatment for stroke. So uh, now I will actually go to uh, my actual talk, which is here. So that comes to the top. Like, uh, that makes us to uh, you know uh, ponder about how the strip treatment has evolved, and I'll be mainly talking about uh, that part of treatment of stroke. Uh, stroke can be managed with neurosurgery as well. Stroke can be managed with uh, uh, the medical part, which is mainly done by neurologists, and and so therefore it's a complex topic, probably involving multiple specialties. And uh, I'll be mainly speaking to endovascular treatment of stroke. So thank you again. And these are my all institutions where I have trained and I have gained experience to reach to this stage today. So I'm very thankful to all the uh, institutes which have contributed in my uh, learn uh, like knowledge acquisition. So uh, terminologies, we will be speaking about a lot about endovascular thrombectomy, also called as mechanical thrombectomy. We will talk about large vessel occlusion, um, we will, which is in short called as LVO. Uh, of course, people know about CT angiogram and perfusion, which will be called as CTAP, and tissue pulp plasminogen activator is TPA, as we all know. Now, so today's learning objectives will be uh, to understand the decision-making protocol in, in endovascular thrombectomy patients or mechanical thrombectomy. So um, today we'll be talking about uh, learning objectives um, uh, about stroke. Uh, so these learning objectives are mainly to understand the decision making in, in our EVT patients and review the role of TPA, as I said. Uh, we will also analyze uh, the hyperacute management and, and the decision making process which goes behind these EVT procedures. So um, as we know, around 800,000 Americans uh, suffer uh, from new or recurrent stroke annually. And when we, this is an old article, uh, but why it is important to know the prevalence of uh, stroke in Canada because it gave us a, a, a significant projection that almost uh, around 400,000 people uh, were, were getting affected by stroke where uh, the projection by 2038 was going up to 800,000 again. And, and the same can be seen on these graphs where you can see that 
uh, stroke becomes prevalent in, in, in elderly patients, and that's why most of the patients are elderly. But if you see here on the right side, you can see the projection and the prevalence of stroke going up and up and, and increasing significantly by uh, the end of 2038. So, uh, so that's why this, this article, which was actually published in 2015, uh, it becomes relevant because it gives you a foresight into the future. And that's why uh, as things are evolving, we are, we, are, we are kind of pushing the envelope and try to do our best in treating these patients. So um, as we know, stroke symptoms can be, um, you know, uh, drooping of the face, weakness of the arm, difficulty in speech, um, you know, and then it, it's, it's time to call to the ambulance. And that, that uh, uh, is called as a FAST uh, acronym. And at the same time, and the other thing which, is, which, is, which can be added to this FAST mnemonic is, is the balance issues or the visual problems. So, so commonly in, in our terms, we call this as the FAST. Uh, and those are the terms which we commonly try to explain to general population about how to identify a stroke. And as soon as you identify a stroke, you have to call 911 or you have to go to the nearby emergency. Uh, we know the types of stroke can be ischemic and hemorrhagic, or there can be small uh, um, uh, strokes, which we call as transient ischemic attacks, which are precursors to you know, something impending in future. So uh, majority of strokes are ischemic stroke, and we are going to talk about ischemic stroke today. Now, Usual management of acute stroke, uh, how do we proceed? So this, this comes to our decision-making process. So when the patient of a stroke or, or uh, a patient with an acute um, onset neurological deficit with, with or without language involvement comes to the ER, normally this is first assessed by neurology. So they first diagnose stroke and then they also diagnose the severity of stroke. Once, once that happens, uh, involvement of radiology becomes important because then we, we send the patient to a plain CT head where we first identify that, okay, there is nothing else which is causing these symptoms and there is an established diagnosis of stroke made on a multi-phase CT angiogram where you can actually see the large vessel occlusion. Now, when, when uh, the plain CT and the CT angio with or without perfusion is done, that is a time you basically decide whether this is uh, you know, a large vessel occlusion or this is a small vessel occlusion, which probably cannot be reached via endovascular means. So that is the time where we decide it's a medical versus endovascular management. And as I said, it involves uh, multiple specialities, multiple uh, uh, you know, uh, crew, like the whole crew of uh, management of stroke involves radiology, neurology, and then intervention, which, uh, which comes at the end but becomes the most important part of the process. So when you decide that it's a, it's, it's a large vessel occlusion or it's a small vessel occlusion on CT angiogram, the treatment de depends on, on, on that diagnosis. So if it's a distal vessel occlusion and the patient is still within the time frame of tissue plasminogen inactivator, which I'll, I'll talk to later, uh, patients usually get TPA. Uh, we also give TPA for large vessel occlusions and, and that is something which probably will change in future, but right now TPA is, is is a go for all kinds of occlusion, but it especially becomes important for those occlusion or those clots which are very distal and hard to reach from endovascular point of view. So TPA still has a major, major role in stroke. Um, but if we see that there's a large vessel occlusion, that patient essentially goes for endovascular management and we perform endovascular thrombectomy or mechanical thrombectomy. Now, when I said that neurology will assess the patient when the patient comes, uh, if the patient is having symptoms of stroke, which is, as I said, uh, you know, one of the fast signs, then patients will be first assessed by neurology and they will assess the stroke severity. There may be sometimes occasional uh, you know, situations where we see that there's a large vessel occlusion, the patient has minimal symptoms. And, be, and that is because he's actually dependent on, on his collaterals and the brain has developed long-term collaterals. That can still also happen in chronic occlusions where there is, uh, there is a chronic occlusion and there's an acute component to it. So patients do not develop clinical symptoms. They do not develop weakness on one side. They don't develop language issues. And that's why this part is also important. So that, that is assessed by uh, the NIHS score or National Institute of Health Stroke Scale, where you define whether the stroke is minor, the stroke is moderate, stroke is moderate to severe or very severe stroke. So it all depends on multiple, uh, you know, um, areas of physical examination and assessment of motor, sensory, and uh, speech functions by neurology. And then you have a score, which they, they say, okay, this patient is having an NIH score of six or an NIH score of five, an NIH score of 11. So severe uh, um, stroke usually is, is, is something in between 
you know, more than six, I will say. Uh, but uh, right now, as I said, the indications are uh, changing and then people are also going to low and I just score large visual occlusions because they fear that in future that may change. So um, that is why this becomes important. Once there is an NIH score and you know that this is a moderate to severe stroke, the patient will go for a normal uh, plain CT contrast head. So why do you need a plain CT head? So you need a plain CT head to basically rule out any other, uh, you know, uh, pathology, which may cause the same similar uh, clinical symptom, uh, which may be just a seizure or a tumor or a bleed. Um, once you rule out, rule all other, uh, you know, uh, differentials, you, you, and if you don't see anything major, which is causing the symptom, then that means that probably this patient is also uh, having a large vessel occlusion, which is difficult to identify on a plain CT, but sometimes you can see um, the MCA sign and hyperdense MCA sign on, uh, on one of the vessels on the plain CT, where you can still see the clot on the plain CT scan, which becomes hyperdense. So uh, uh, the other key point of uh, doing a plain CT is to know how much uh, you know, tissue is already stroked out. So that we know by, by what we call as aspect score. So uh, that, is, that is given by the University of Calgary stroke team and which is based on their uh, you know, work on that. And it's called as Alberta Stroke Program Early CT Score. So that uh, aspect score usually uh, is a perfect score of 10. And then as soon as you are seeing hyperdensity developing in one of the areas in MCA territories or um, uh, supratentorial uh, hemisphere, uh, you can see that the score starts to drop. So if there is an area of one hyperdensity, uh, one point will be dropped from, from a score perfect score of 10, and the score changes as there are more areas which are involved. So you can see on this right side, these areas are basically based on the MCA territory distribution. So they can be divided at the level of the basal ganglia as M1, M2, and M3. So if you see a hyperdensity in M1, that's one point, M2, that's another point, M3, that's another point. And then four points are given to the basal ganglia region, which and one point each for insula, lenticulate, nucleus, caudate, nucleus, internal capsule. And then when you come up in the screen, like around the uh, area of corona radiata, you can also divide into M4, M5, and M6. And these are the cortical regions, which we uh, assess by playing CT. So if you see a whole area which is involved, involving all the M1 to M6 regions, that means, and involving the basal ganglion, that means the score is zero. And if you see no stroke, that's a perfect score of 10. So most patients, uh, you know, go in between these two ranges and, 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 and then you also do a multiphase CT angiogram to see and document where is the large vessel occlusion? Because this is a phase where you will see, okay, if the occlusion is proximal, because the current guidelines actually tell us to go for the proximal occlusion in uh, M1 or uh, the first part of middle cerebral artery, and also up to first half of or proximal part of M2 uh, sometimes. But that has to be diagnosed on a multiphase CTA. So you document the large vessel occlusion, and then you do a CT perfusion, which is also um, uh, very important to know the penumbra. So when we are talking about CT perfusion, uh, it has its own uh, pros and cons, and I'm not going to detail about, you know, when it's most vital, when it has to be done, or when it can falsely guide you to, you know, to believe the, the core uh, on, a, on a perfusion. But basic uh, understanding is that if you are doing it after six hours of onset, it becomes more important than if you're doing it very early in the course, because then it can sometimes falsely predict the core more. So um, CT perfusion is, is something which is based on the flow of contrast in the, in the occluded vessel. And then you basically look at three parameters, which is mean transient time, cerebral blood flow, and cerebral blood volume. So mean transient time increases when there is an occlusion uh, of a large vessel, of, um, vessel uh, and you can see that on the scans. And, and cerebral blood flow usually corresponds to the mean transient time. And, and then the most important point to detect penumbra is the cerebral blood volume. So if the cerebral blood volume is maintained or increased, that means that part is still viable. And, and that gives you the idea of penumbra. If cerebral blood flow is also reduced, that means the, 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 you know, the stroke is already evolved and there is nothing to be saved. So the combination of uh, mean transient type cerebral blood flow and cerebral blood volume gives you the idea of penumbra and, and what is the core of the stroke. Uh, and what is the penumbra of the stroke? So if there's if there's a perfect match between these two parameters and cerebral blood volume, that means the the the, the penumbra is basically 
almost negligible and everything which is seen on the flow uh, chart here is stroked out because the cerebral blood volume also has reduced. But if you see a maintained cerebral blood volume and only in, uh, involvement of cerebral, reduced cerebral blood flow or increased mean transient time, that means that area is still viable and that area is to be saved by endovascular intervention. So that becomes very important. And as I said, another idea you can get by multiple CT angiogram and angiography, which will actually diagnose the large vessel occlusion, as I can see here. And as the phases go by, where, where there is, uh, you know, the, the, the machine scans the brain after an interval of a few more seconds, you will actually see the amount of collaterals seen on that hemisphere. So if you see a significant collaterals, even after delayed uh, um, CT scans, or a multi-phase CT scans, that means that there is, there is that you expect that there is sufficient penumbra available in that case. So uh, a combination of perfusion and multi-phase CTA will give you an, a somewhat idea about the penumbra or tissue which can be saved. If you see no collaterals in this phase, in the, in the last phase of a multi-phase CTA, you assume that there is, there is supposed to be a matched effect on a CT perfusion and probably uh, there is very, very less amount which can still be saved and everything else is stroked out already. So uh, collateral assessment is very important. And nowadays we basically rely on a, um, a rapid software, which is, which is basically AI in, in the vascular uh, uh, arena, where you can get a quick uh, idea of core, which is seen as the, as the pink color uh, you know, diagram, a pink color uh, on, on the left side of this map. And, and the, the green one actually tells you the, the tissue, which is where the cerebral blood volume is still maintained. So it gives you a mismatch ratio between the area which is completely stroked out, which is, which is actually depicts, which is depicted by cerebral blood flow um, less than 30%. And, and if there's a Tmax more than six and this threshold can also change, it tells you about the amount of penumbra which can be saved. And then you take a ratio of these two volumes and if the ratio is around or more than 1.8, that tells you that the area of penumbra is significantly mismatched as compared to the area of core. When you see the core actually equals with the uh, with the area of uh, um, you know uh, area which is which is still not stroked out, the the mismatch volume becomes either equal or less than one point eight, and that means that the defect is mostly matched. So this is one quick glance uh, on which you can actually see on your phone to understand whether there is something to be saved or not. And if you see a mismatch more than one point eight, meant that means the penumbra is significantly still there to be saved. So usually we go for those case, case, cases where there is significant mismatch. And this has to be, again, compared with the plain CT head, look at the aspect score, and also look at the CT perfusion and CT angium uh, on based on multi-phase CTA. So when, when all this information comes together, we decide whether this particular patient will go for endovascular treatment or will benefit from any kind of clot retrieval or not, or if, if it's already too late for us to go in. So based on, on the aspects, usually these are the traditional uh, guidelines which we take into consideration, uh, aspects more than six, uh, significant stroke, because if you are basically treating a large distribution in a very mild stroke, you can actually you know either cause more damage, you can either you know, throw the clot further distal, and you can actually sometimes make patient worse. So it's, it's still debatable whether you, know, you should go in for a, a low NHS score patient or patient having just mild symptoms with the large visual occlusions. Uh, some people would like to keep them uh, admitted in ICU and observe if they deteriorate, then they go in. But usual uh, uh, you know, a guideline is basically you know, stroke aspect more than six, NHS score more than six, documented LVO on the CT angio, adequate collateral seen on CT angio and unmatched perfusion defect. As I said, uh, you can see it from the cerebral blood flow, cerebral blood volume maps, or from a quick rapid software. And if there's a lot, lot of penumbra to be saved, then it's usually a go for EVT. But it, on the other hand, if you see that the aspect is very low, less than six, and again, this is something which is changing as we talk, because uh, now people are also change, uh, you know, going in for cases where aspect is four to six, and, and there, is, there have been few studies which show some benefit, but majority of uh, 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 literature supports you know, that if the aspect is poor, less than six, then the results are not going to be good in, in that particular patient because the area is already stroked out. So aspects less than six, and I just score which is less than six, uh, um, that tells you basically mild stroke, uh, poor collateral on CT angio, and a very, very matched perfusion defect on cerebral blood flow, cerebral blood volume maps, 
and peripheral occlusions, or if it's a very distal occlusion scene, um, uh, then it's probably you know better to either go for medical management or not to intervene because then your risks of complications increase and 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 the relative benefit you are trying to achieve comes down. So uh, so this is basically how we decide or uh, based on plain CT, CT angio, and a perfusion to decide whether this patient is a good fit for endovascular treatment or not. Now coming to TPA, this is again basically a, 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 a magic drug for treatment of stroke, and actually this works well for a, for a distal occlusion, uh, where where currently the time window is within 4.5 hours of onset. So if the patient comes to a, a comprehensive stroke center within four and a half hours of onset, uh, even if it's a larger occlusion or a distal vessel occlusion, our neurology team is is keen to give TPA at least if there are no other contraindications. And uh, and for me, uh, if it's a very very distal occlusion, suppose it's an M3 M4 occlusion or the clot is very deep in the ACA territory, I think this works best because then the odds of uh, you know taking the risks become very very averse to endovascular treatment. Then you are you are trying to achieve uh, you know a, a distal perfusion with endovascular treatment and then you may cause more damage but again this is also changing with the rapidly evolving uh, you know hardwares we have got rapidly evolving soft stents we have got so uh, i think this will change how distal we can go but tpa will still uh, you know uh, uh, the major drug for in my opinion for distal occlusions where you you probably won't go endovascularly because of the risks of causing more damage now, uh, uh, TPA background, uh, everyone knows, uh, may cause you know, early reperfusion, early bleeding in, in, in case of a stroked out area, but it may also help dissolve residual you know, distal thrombi after endovascular thrombectomy and may achieve complete occlusion, uh, complete re, uh, reperfusion uh, in certain cases. But when, again, it depends on the clot burden. So if it's a proximal vessel occlusion, the chances of having complete reperfusion just with TPA are very low. So that's why usually if there's a large vessel occlusion, we give TPA, but we still go for endovascular treatment. Although in comparison to a small vessel occlusion, TPA generally suffices. Uh, but again, there are some downsides for TPA that if there is a large proximal located thrombi, as I said, the lactic effect is very limited. You can cause significant risk of cerebral hemorrhage with with IV uh, LTFLase. And now there is tenecteplase in the in the in the uh, you know a scenario, and that there are significant trials which have actually which have actually conveyed. Uh, one of the actual trials was done by a, a collaborator at Sunnybrook that actual tenecteplase also is non-inferior to TPA. And it, again, it's a cheaper option back in India. And I, when I was there, I think people were already started to use uh, tenecteplase as compared to alteplase. So uh, that is uh, that is the, uh, you know, the medical side of it, but usually our neurology team is very keen and very active on that and uh, in management of uh, you know, patients with TPAs. So the question becomes like, is TPA useful for large vessel occlusion? And that is a, a question which is very difficult to answer. There have been few trials, uh, like a direct MT trial, DVT trial, and SKIP trial, where they, are, they have given some uh, uh, you know, pointers towards uh, you know, benefit with only endovascular thrombectomy or benefit with endovascular thrombectomy with TPA. And, and, and the results have almost been the same, and, and there have been no statistical uh, difference, as I said. And, and, and these are basically non-inferiority trials. And as you can see here, um, it basically says endovascular thrombectomy was not inferior to IV TPA plus thrombectomy patients. Similar uh, uh, trials have, have come up uh, recently, and there has been this discussion about whether uh, you know, TPA should be given for large vessel occlusions because of its inefficiency or because of efficiency of the endovascular techniques today. So um, people are wondering that if TPA can cause more complications because of hemorrhage, uh, when it's not going to you know, actually dissolve a large vessel occlusion, uh, versus, you know, some benefit of, uh, uh, you know, when you're doing a TP, when you're doing an EVT for a large vessel occlusion, and you, if you throw a distal emboli or distal thrombus, maybe TPA can act on those. So it's it's still uh, debatable, uh, but it, as of today, uh, you know, uh, the consensus is TPA with EVT for, for large vessel occlusions if the patient is, of course, eligible. If, of course, not eligible, those patients directly go for endovascular thrombectomy. So um, this whole treatment of EVT changed 
way uh, in 2015, as Professor Kings was saying, like initially this was intra-arterial TPA, but then there are so many trials came in 2015, which clearly documented uh, the benefit of, uh, of, of thrombectomy in acute stroke. And, and that actually, um, you know, these are the trials which were, which were there in 2015. Uh, Mr. Clean Escape, Extend IA trial, SWIFT prime and Revascade trial, and they, you know, actually provide a level one evidence of uh, benefit in, in patients with large vessel occlusion. So these are the patients uh, who, are, uh, who are treated within six hours of symptom onset. I think that has also changed uh, um, uh, currently, and currently it's not the time. Currently it's the, the amount of brain which can be saved. So now the whole concept of management of EVP has changed from you know, a fixed time limit as in TPA versus uh, you know, how much brain is still viable at the time the patient comes to you. So it may be you know, six hours, it may be you know, 12 hours, it may be sometimes 24 hours, but it depends on uh, the amount of um, you know, the, the tissue which can be salvaged. And if there's significant mismatch between the core and the penumbra, if there's significant penumbra to be saved, it, it, it makes all sense to, to go in and try to retrieve it. So um, now, based on these trials, those things have changed, basically. There was trial, which was uh, diffuse trial and dawn trial, which, which all came way back in, uh, you know, in the same era, in 2017, 18. Uh, and and this, this included like uh, interventionists from all over the world, and there was consistent treatment that them is even possible after you know the traditional six hours. So that changed way in, in, in 2016, 17 to 18. Uh, and now the time uh, that the time limit uh, of intervention has basically gone out of the uh, out of our you know working place. So we don't even ask like when was the uh, you know when 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 actually how long the patient is going to come. What what are we going to concentrate on? We are going to concentrate on the CT and see if the brain has stroked out or not. Because some patients are fast progressors and they will stroke out very soon, and some patients are slow progressors. So they may remain intact, and especially for basilar occlusion and posterior fossa, uh, um, uh, you know, strokes. Uh, they, sometimes thrombectomy has been done after two days, uh, you know, because the patient was relatively clinically fine, uh, and then it was compensating, and suddenly there was a decomposition, and there was a large area of penumbra to be saved. So, uh, what I want to say is, like, the whole focus in endovascular world has shifted from time-based uh, intervention to a tissue-based intervention, and and as we know, coming to the techniques, there are two two major techniques, and and I usually try try the aspiration first because it it's fast, it's easier. And, and most of the times only aspiration works, which, will, which is called as an ADAPT technique, a direct aspiration first pass technique, versus using something called as a, a snare, we call as stent retriever. And, and, and the stent retriever is like, like a mesh which goes in uh, through our catheters, catches and traps the, uh, the clot, and then we bring it out all together and open the vessel. You can see it here, this is the clot, this is the way we cross the clot, uh, this is only adapt. So once we once we are we take our large bore catheters and we do not want to cross the clot, we can just keep our um, large bore catheters engaged with the rear end of the clot and suck it all out together. All as compared to a, a, a stent retriever technique where you actually have to cross the clot with the micro wire and the micro catheter, then the wire comes out and the catheter comes out and you deploy a stent and you smear it and then you take it together with the aspiration. So the only difference is either you're using only aspiration or you're using aspiration with stent retriever. And that is actually a combination of both the, uh, both the techniques and which we call a Solambra technique where uh, you know, a combination of aspiration and as well as stent retriever is done. So it all depends on the preference of the operator. Um, uh, some people will go for with us with the stent retriever at the first time only, and some people will try adapt and, and try aspiration first, because it also, uh, you know, um, plays on your, uh, you know, in the background about the financial aspect. And I know where there's there are areas in the world where the patient has to pay. So stent retriever becomes too costly at that at those times. So it makes perfect sense to just try aspiration first. And if it works, you don't need to use the stent retriever, but if it doesn't work, you have that at your back pocket. So you can always use that. So, uh, I mean, this is, this is a small video where you, know, you can see a, a clot in the proximal MCA vessel, and then you are crossing the clot with a micro catheter, and, and now the stent is coming out and which will actually trap the clot. And you will see the, uh, 
stent being deployed. And then the, the reperfusion is maintained as the stent just pushes the clot at the wall and it maintains the, the vascular uh, flow immediately. And then you wait for some time to make sure that, the, that your, your, your stent engages the clot. And then you, some people will do a balloon guide catheter where they will arrest the flow and take the clot out. And now again, um, that depends on operator. Many people don't use these balloon guide catheters and they just go with the simple uh, you know, um, catheters which will give them distal access and free maybe came up. Um, there is some benefit with balloon guide using balloon guide catheter. And then they say that once there's a complete flow arrest, the chances of distal embolic events when you're trying to snare the clot becomes less because there is no flow in the neck. So I personally don't use balloon guide catheters now. Um, they were being used earlier, but I think uh, it just reduces one step and I've not seen a lot of distal emboli, uh, you know, uh, after, after just using a stent with a, with a simple distal access catheter. So uh, once we achieve uh, uh, reperfusion, we grade this as uh, you know a, a ticky score or thrombolysis in cerebral ischemia score. Grade zero is if you're not able to open the vessel and there's no perfusion, and grade three is actually complete perfusion. Um, so uh, coming to uh, the guidelines, the implications about you know classical standard guidelines on M1 and proximal M2 occlusions, but do we always stick to the guidelines? Of course, it depends on the context, and as I said. Now, the whole idea is changing. Now, we are even doing, uh, you know, uh, a thrombectomy for a very old patient, but who is very active, and, and, and these patients actually walk out, and they live in it independently, as we can see here, left MC occlusion. We are seeing sometimes uh, we, we open a vessel, and the patient still develops a second uh, uh, occlusion immediately a few minutes after or a few hours after. And if there's significant penumbra still there and there's a good mismatch between the core and the penumbra, we still go in and take the clot again. So you can do that and, and overall patients have benefits. Similarly, uh, you know, patients who are just having a very distal occlusion and only speech involvement and no motor deficit, we still go for it. And, and, and that's why what, what I call as pushing the envelope there. These are all offline indications, but they actually benefit the patients uh, in, 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 in the most you know, efficient manner because you can go in with your catheters and the stent and you can even open these uh, distal vessels. But this, this happens when, as you develop expertise, when you become confident, when you become smooth with, with opening the proximal MCA vessels, then actually you can go distally and you can go to distal M2 proximal M3 vessels and and uh, and open this uh, open the vessels which are distal as well so uh, but this is another situation where a patient had a bilateral vertebral artery occlusion with basilar artery occlusion these are standard indications uh, if you see that there is uh, there is no major uh, you know involvement of stroke or, or major brainstem involvement in the stroke I, I can see there is a patchy involvement here the patient was 26 year old and eventually this patient made a very good recovery she walked out of the hospital so i think uh, 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 another idea which you can see on the mri in stroke cases is whether you know diffusion is showing you a restriction but the flare uh, uh, is is still uh, showing you non-involvement on that area. That means there's a diffusion flare mismatch. And some people use that uh, also to see if there is penumbra, because if there is complete evolution of stroke, you will definitely see that uh, the flare also shows that changes which are seen on the diffusion rate restriction as compared to those when it's, it's very early in the course, you are seeing a diffusion rate restriction, but there's no change on flare. That means there is significant penumbra and that area is not completely stroked out. So there is there's good benefit in, in going in and retrieving that clot and give the benefit to the patient. And also it depends on what is the age of the patient and, and, and how, how active they have been. So um, coming to, you know, sometimes a situation where patients present with bilateral large vessel occlusion. So you have a, a occlusion on the right side and your occlusion on the left side, probably because of a central etiology, like a, like a clot in the left ventricle. So in that situation, you finish one and then you go on to the uh, you know, other side to take the clot out again. So it, it all can be done. You come from the right side, then you go into the left side and you take both the clots out. Uh, distal occlusions, as I said, now the indications are changing. So we, we, we now challenge uh, like ourselves, basically, that if you can safely go distally and also depends on if there's a loop there, if there's straight anatomy, if the patient is young, so it's a, it's a very, very, you know, a combination of factors. And I'll say like, uh, it, it depends on the operator, but, but the risk of causing a perforation in distal vessel is also real. If you're, if you're not very, uh, you know, gentle in going in the distal vessels, but if you are, and you, 
you think that it is a straight vessel which you can go in there's it makes all the perfect sense to go in with the stent as you can see in an m3 branch and take the cloth out um, um same thing sometimes distal occlusion can also involve the ac atrophy as you can see this patient had mc occlusion this patient had ac occlusion and then we opened the mca and then we went into the uh, ac atrophy because you can see this occlusion is almost a3 a4 region but once the mc was completely open we actually went and, and, and retrieved this slot also. Again, it all depends on uh, you know, your own expertise, um, the, the, the vessels are straight or not, and whether the patient is young enough to go in or not. So um, uh, again, sometimes the clot doesn't come out in, uh, and, there's, it, and also depends on the, you know, the duration of onset. If there's a lot, like a, a, too much uh, time has been lost, and the patient comes to you in a delayed fashion, sometimes the clot becomes very difficult to retrieve. And in those cases, sometimes rescue stenting, or if there's if there's a you know um, atherosclerotic disease to start with, uh, the 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 vessel will not open even after your multiple attempts. Then sometimes people leave a, a stent uh, in place to keep the vessel open. As you can see here, this you can see a clot here, but there's a vessel, there's a stent which is pushing that clot onto the wall, and that patient actually improved significantly. This was only again for the language function. Um, as I said, intracranial atherosclerotic disease involves intracranial vessels as well, and then you will need, uh, you know, a, a, a robust stent like a wingspan stent. Again, this is very technical, so I'll keep it very short. Uh, uh, this, this, this is another kind of stent which can be used in a in an atherosclerotic disease of uh, intracranial vessels, where even after multiple attempts, you're not either able to open it or if you open it, it, it occludes slowly over the period of time. So uh, when you are in the angiogram, you say, okay, we got the occlusion. We got the reperfusion, and then you wait for you know five minutes. The vessel closes again. So if, if this is an underlying uh, intracranial atherosclerotic disease, this is very common. In that situation, you can again do a rescue stenting and make and make sure that the vessel stays open, and 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 you can you can uh, deploy a stent. So um, like this in case uh, this was ICAD, I think uh, this patient we were, we were able to open again with a wingspan stent. So uh, coming to you know uh, the role of EVT in 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 low um, aspects patients, I think there there are enough studies where say they say even if EVT is not able to reverse the deficit, at least it will reduce the amount of cytotoxic edema which is going to happen post stroke. So uh, there is some benefit, uh, if, uh, you know, of doing EVT, if, even if there's no neurological deficits, because sometimes you can avoid decompensative venectomy. So there have been uh, some, uh, you know, uh, trials uh, which actually have documented the reduction in the rates of decompensative venectomy without any neurological improvement. So EVT makes sense even in that situation that maybe, maybe uh, if, if, if the stroke is not large enough, we may be able to avoid a decompression. That's again, you know, avoiding another stress to the patient. Now, uh, complications, as I said, everything is not very, very, uh, you know, uh, perfect in, in endovascular world, and you can have intraprocedural problems. You can have post procedural problems like uh, vessel injury, reocclusion, hemorrhage, and edema. And many times we see there is there is a reperfusion hemorrhage after you know you have opened a vessel which was occluded for a long time and there was low aspects. That means the strict tissue was already stroked out. So we have to balance again the complication versus the benefit, and this 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 constant thought process between the benefits and the risks uh, like makes makes this procedure very operator dependent so uh, future as i said the future depends on uh, whether we are going to uh, you know go for uh, medium large vessel occlusions like for m4 or m3 or m4 vessels or we will go after low aspect cvt where the aspect is four to six that means significant amount of brain is already stroked out, but there's still some part which is which which can be saved. So I think these are the things on which there are trials going on. Uh, and right now, um, um, as as, uh, as uh, we are also enrolled in this escape NEVO trial, that's a medium vessel occlusions. So we right now we are doing them as, as one-off cases, but these things, once the trial comes, I, I'm sure this is going to be positive. And, and then people will, like, there'll be guidelines to, you know, go in distal, and, and take out the vessel, take out the clot in M3 and M4 vessels or distal AC vessels also. So we will see about that. And also the trials on low aspects, there is still some data that, you know, the rates of hemorrhage is high in low aspects from ectomy, but overall there is some good functional uh, outcome seen at 90 days in those patients. As I said, these are, these are not clear, robust uh, data and, and there's still some discussion happening whether we should 
go and follow aspects cases or not. So to summarize, I will say um, stroke EVT is always the balancing act. There is no classical rule. There's no classical, uh, you know, uh, um, a patient which will always fit in one like of these boxes. So there's there's a lot of uh, discussion involved uh, here between the neurology team, between the radio neuro intervention team, and between uh, you know the, uh, the the radiology as well, which will actually document and help you in documenting the aspect score. So uh, many patients now just go, uh, many many physicians actually just look at the plain CT, just make sure that there's no large stroke and the aspect is good. And then they just take the patient for, for angio directly. So uh, they don't rely on the perfusion. They just see the CT angio and they document the large visual occlusion and they take the patient straight to EVT. Again, this is uh, this changes between center to center, but usually the benefits outweigh the risks, and that's why the number needed to treat for stroke is now three. So it's like uh, it's it has shown immense benefit in changing the overall outcome of a patient in stroke world. So uh, with that, I will uh, stop here. Um, ask if anyone has questions or doubts. Thank you so much <clears throat> for this excellent uh, presentation. I mean, it's a tour de force uh, being able to go through uh, all uh, of the aspects uh, in uh, stroke treatment within uh, just like the allotted time that you had, but uh, you very clearly indicated the main points here. Uh, that is that EVT is a game changer and that the main reason for it uh, being a game changer is that we are now knowing how to select the right patient. I think patient selection is, is the true art of uh, a stroke treatment. There are some, as you said, that are fast progressors that even after two hours, that would be in a perfect time window uh, where, where treatment is futile. And there are those that after even eight hours or 10 hours, still can benefit from the treatment. So this is, I think, the real important issue. I think the other point that uh, you made that is very important is that in the end, there are no strong guidelines as to uh, what is best. Is it stent retrieval? Is it aspiration? Is it a combination? Is it a, like everyone has different um, uh, different experiences. And it's similar to aneurysm coiling. There are some people who coil every single aneurysm <laughs> with the protection of a balloon. And then there are those who believe in the web. There are those who believe in uh, the uh, flow diverter. And I think it just says that uh, there are many ways that lead to Rome, uh, as uh, the old saying goes. Uh, uh, the goal has to be recanalization and the correct patient selection. And you made a beautiful point in this. Um, I'm not sure I'm uh, uh, taking it to the overall um, coordinator of this module. Are there any questions? I can't see any in the chat. Um, there, I don't see any open questions. Yeah, probably I can ask some question, uh, Professor. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I I wanted to know because uh, again again in stroke uh, time is brain, so and mm -hmm. there are multiple uh, neuro imaging that can be performed. You mentioned few uh, CTA, uh, CT perfusion. Uh, Sometimes uh, you may do a, 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 a catheter angiogram, or there are some people also doing a MR AI and M MR perfusion. So in your protocol, uh, which I must do uh, uh, imaging uh, for, for before you decide on the treatment. My second question, uh, Professor, uh, you, I, I, I'm happy that you are talking about uh, uh, even uh, by doing uh, 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 EVT, uh, even those with a uh, uh, high, low chance of recovery, neurological recovery, you can reduce the risk of uh, 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 worsening edema and uh, avoid uh, decompression uh, because definitely in the compressive cranectomy, there's a very strict criteria for us to, to decide on the surgery. Uh, may I know, do you have any experience looking at uh, whether it reduces the risk of uh, uh, hemorrhagic transformation or it actually also help in uh, uh, controlling intracranial pressure uh, in those patients and, and uh, would you now going uh, for that reason, we, we treat patients even with a very low aspect score. Uh, my last question, Professor, uh, we, we, you were talking about the mismatch between the core and penumbra area. So in your experience after treatment, do you really were able to salvage those penumbra area or the area that have been salvaged are different 
from what you see preoperatively, or are those core areas really not salvageable? Do you have experienced that some core areas have been salvaged by your procedure? Thank you, Professor. Thanks, Dr. Liu. So I think uh, the first thing which you asked was, I think, about the imaging modality, and that changes uh, from uh, you know one center to other. So uh, I think across across uh, uh, um, Canada, at least everyone is based uh, is basing their opinion on CT angiogram and perfusion. Uh, but the first imp most important scan again, we 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 devise something and we come back to the basics again. So I think the most important thing is is a plain CT scan because the plain CT scan will actually give you an aspect score, and that will tell you how much brain is already stroked out. Because if the aspect is three or two or one. That means the patient already has a big MCH right free stroke. And then when you open those vessels, there has to be a reperfusion hemorrhage. So the complications increase, right? The rate of complications increase. So, uh, so I, I practice CT, CT angiogram. Uh, I know there are some uh, colleagues, some friends, um, they, they do MRI and they just base their opinion based on diffusion versus flare. So changes which are reversible, changes which are irreversible so that they can you know, compare between uh, these two sequences. Um, that's fine. Uh, depends on you know operator, as I said. Uh, coming to your second question was uh, uh, the benefit of uh, uh, decompressive like EVT and decompressive craniectomy rates, right? So I think um, based on based on the perfusion, you you can predict what areas which are going to save. Uh, and again, the perfusion map is just one quick guide, uh, the rapid software. But then you look at the um, actual cerebral blood flow, cerebral blood flow volume, and the cerebral blood volume, and then you can actually predict to some extent which areas which are going to save and which areas the damage is irreversible. So core, uh, it's sometimes uh, you know uh, it's also um, not completely reliable. I will say. But what is seen in a in a in a delayed CT perfusion is most commonly correct. I, I doc, Professor King's things can also weigh in here. Uh, I, but like it, it's not com you cannot completely rely on it, but it just gives you an idea, and and then you can actually you know uh, you will see that you know that the core in the in in the scan next day or day after will actually you know correspond to what you were seeing on the initial imaging. Um, and the last part of question was that you cannot predict, I think, the, the site of uh, hemorrhage after um, uh, EVT, because the most common area is the, is the most, um, you know, vascular area of the brain, which is the deep tissues, like the, the basal ganglia. So most often, if there's a reperfusion bleed after thrombectomy, it's in the area of uh, basal ganglia. Um, of course, you know, a distal uh, bleeds can happen. And, uh, you can actually perforate an artery and then you will have a hematoma in that area. But usually, like the prediction of where it will bleed is, is, is not very, very consistent. It usually bleeds uh, you know, in, a, in, the, in the deep basal ganglia of the brain. I would love to have Professor King's view on that. Yeah, uh, I, I fully agree with all the different aspects uh, that you just mentioned. Uh, I think uh, the only um, kind of caveat that we have with the perfusion imaging is within the first six hours. Because if you have, just imagine the following situation. You right now, all of a sudden, occlude your blood vessel before your collaterals uh, kick in. And in this very moment, you do a CTP. Your collaterals will be zero, which means that your uh, cerebral blood volume and flow will be extremely low and will falsely tell you that everything is all over. And this is why Greg Albers and other people who are very much into CT perfusion actually now say, you know what, in the first six hours, six hours, maybe the CT perfusion should not guide your, um, your management. And as uh, Professor Kumar said, maybe in the first six hours, it could be sufficient to just do a plain CT and a CTA. It is more after six hours where you need more dedicated imaging. And Mayan Goyal, one of the like giants in our field, uh, um, actually uh, once said, uh, it, it depends on, again, your... Um, uh, your your the the timing of the patient should determine the timing of your uh, or the type of your imaging, i.e., if a patient um, the the later he comes, the more you are on the fence between should I treat or should I not treat, 
the better your imaging has to be. Perfect example, posterior circulation. Uh, some patients with a basilar artery stroke, uh, they have a lot of tissue to save, even after eight hours. Some patients have already completely stroked out uh, their pons and uh, uh, would, have, would be locked in if you save them. Uh, and, and here you need best imaging, i.e. MRI. But then there are those uh, who come in after like one hour of onset, you see on the CT that there's uh, aspects of 10, you see an M1 occlusion because you see already in hyperdense MCA sign and the patient has left hemispheric symptoms. You don't even use a CTA. You can get the patient right into the angiosuite. So it really depends on um, how fast the patient is coming, how much you are on the fence, which, which type of imaging you would need. I completely agree. Um, I mean, uh, it, it, like plain CT will give you so much information. As I said, like we devise technology and then we come back to the basics. So I think we have gone to CTA, CT perfusion. We saw its drawbacks as, as Professor King String said, uh, within six hours, it may misguide you. Uh, and, and, and then you come back to the plain CT again and you say, okay, let's stick to the basics. So uh, C, plain CT and CT angio is actually the most preferred thing uh, for me, uh, if you ask. And I will just make sure that perfusion aligns with it but if the perfusion is not aligning with it and my gut feeling is still like okay this is showing me wrong uh, volume of the core i will still go and do the uh, thrombectomy based on the plain ct results thank you professor uh, professor chen the second chair has already joined us and professor lu if any one of you have any question professor uh, yeah. probably uh, since there's no further question probably we hear the concluding remark from our professor kring professor Yes, uh, thank you very much. I think this was a very educational uh, session, uh, thanks to the excellent presentation of uh, Professor Kuma. We would like to thank again the ACNS, Professor Kato, Professor Raja, and you, Professor Wim, for uh, organizing this. And uh, great thanks and kudos to Professor Kuma. This was an excellent presentation. Thanks. And with this, I'll move now over to my co chair, Professor Chen from Taiwan. Thank you very much, Professor Krings and uh, Professor Kuma. Uh, now I hand, hand over the podium to uh, Professor uh, uh, Chen to introduce our second speaker, Professor Lu, and uh, his topic, uh, Professor. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for the organizer to invite me to moderate this section. And after seeing the agenda, I noticed that process, I, I have some, uh, some history with Professor Lu actually because I have uh, an opportunity to visit Huashan Hospital uh, with our awake team in Taiwan, Chonggong Memorial Hospital in 2018. So I might actually see <laughs> so Professor Lu's uh, surgery. So I am uh, very excited about this chance to hear Professor Lu's talk. And uh, Professor Lu is a, a PhD and a neurosurgeon and currently a vice chief doctor in Huashan Hospital. And uh, his uh, major is in awake surgery and language mapping techniques. And also he had a very good publications in their brain function um, study team. Their team, actually I noticed that they have a series of awake surgery. And uh, since uh, 2013, they published their series of using intraoperative MRI to assist the uh, awake surgery uh, beyond my resection. And uh, most, most notably uh, last year, their group published a cross-continent multi-center study with Professor Dufo uh, and Professor Mitch Berger from San Francisco uh, to show that speech arrest and uh, anomia maps in human brains across different language. So I look forward to uh, Professor Lu's talks and uh, congratulations and let's welcome his talk. Language mapping in glioma surgery. Professor Lu, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for your introduction, Dr. Chen. And uh, thank you, the chair, Dr. Liu. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be here. I'm Ju Feng Lu from Shanghai Huashan Hospital. 
Today, I would like to share some recent work by our team about language mapping in glioma surgery. Uh, as we know, we have to face a great challenge during eloquent glioma surgery because it might cause permanent neurologic deficits. We can see the left image show that the instance of glioma <clears throat> by anatomic location. Most of the glioma involves the frontal and the temporal lobe where the language areas are located. For those glioma adjacent to language areas, the best way to preserve language function is mapping the language cortex and some cortical structures before the removal of lesion during operation. However, neurosurgeons must face three challenges during language mapping. First, the language related brain regions are scattered. It included not only the it includes not only the traditional Broca's area, Wernicke's area, but also the inferior parietal lobe and the supplementary motor area also engaged in the language. Second, the processing of language is complex. The below, <clears throat> the below video shows that the dynamic spatial and the temporal representation of verb generation, which asks the patient to generate a verb while hearing a noun. Let's look at the video. You can see it, the, the neural activity starts from the posterior STG, superior temporal gyrus, and uh, starts from the dorsal laryngeal motor cortex, then transfer the information to the inferior, to the inferior frontal gyrus, or the inferior frontal sulcus, around the sulcus. And then spread, spread to the premotor cortex, finally to the sensory motor, sensory motor cortex of the articulators to produce a verb. <clears throat> produce the verb, yes. Third, it is very, so it is very complex. Third, there are about seven kinds of language in the world, including Indo-European language family and the Sino-Tibet, Tibetan language family and so on. For example, English belongs to Indo-European language family. It is non-tonal language, and Mandarin and most of Asian language belongs to Sino-Tibetan language. They are tonal language. There might be difference between them about the brain mechanism. So plenty of techniques where you tried to map the critical areas for language before and during operation. The non-invasive function mapping techniques includes the functional MR, DTI, and TMS EEG. Functional MR was confirmed to be reliable for motor mapping, but not for language mapping. DTI and fiber tract tractography were widely applied in the clinical practice. And the invasive technique included the direct electrical stimulation and the ECOG. These two techniques are the privilege, are the privilege for neurosurgeons of directly talking with the brain. Today, I will mainly discuss the language mapping using DES. During the past 10 years, our team tried to answer three unresolved questions about intraoperative, intraoperative language mapping. The first question, how to localize the language area during awake surgery quickly and easily? As we know, task presentation and the comprehensive recording and assessment of the intraoperative the patient's behavior during awake surgery has been a laborious undertaking since the start of this procedure over a century ago. We need a convenient system to make the procedure simple and handy. The second, second question is, where are the human language areas? Where are the critical language regions for neurosurgeons? We have no idea about it. The third question is, what is the structural, base, stru structural basis for language areas? Or what is the relationship between the stimulation positive sides and the language pathways? To answer it will help protect both critical and subcortical, uh, both cortical and subcortical structure. In order to answer about the, the above questions, we conducted three project, project. We firstly developed a novel intraoperative brain mapping integrated task, uh, task presentation platform to provide an efficient system for awake surgery. Then we established the functional maps of direct electrical stimulation induced speech rest and anomia via multi-center 
uh, study. At last, we also investigate the structural basis of speech arrest areas. Let's look at the first project to develop the brain mapping integrated task presentation platform. <clears throat> Our team has been using interoperative DS to map language areas since 2011. We established our standard procedure for a week survey. We also developed the brain mapping interactive stimulation system. Compared with traditional interoperative task presentation methods, this device is more compatible with the OR environment. It can record the DS responses through the video and audio. audio. It in integrates a variety of common mapping paradigms, such as the picture naming, word reading, and it also displays multi-information simultaneously on multi multiple screens, which significantly improves the efficiency of a weak surgery, shortens the operation duration, and greatly facilitates the language mapping. It has four screens. One is for neurosurgeons. Let's look at. This is the, the screen for neurosurgeons. And to, uh, to observe, observe the patient's responses. The small, the small screen <coughs> is designed for the, sorry. The small screen is designed for the uh, patient to, to, to receive the information, the visual information. Two other screens are designed for the neural elect electrical physiological monitoring technician. And we published this work in operative neurosurgery last year. A commentary indicates that our system may have the potential to greatly improve the safety of a weak surgery. We potentially increase the amount of tumor considered to be safely resectable near eloquent cortex, potentially prolonging the survival. In addition, because the generated re records would be standardized and digital, it will be possible to compare the results of thousands of surgeries across numerous centers. This is a video presenting our system and, uh, and the procedures of a weak surgery in our center. The system, the name of the system is the Brain Mapping Interactive Stimulation System. This is the evolution of the brain mapping uh, task presentation history. This is the system. This is the OR, which is the, the, the task. This is the patient's face. the camera observe the head and the foot motor movement. This is the neural electrical well, monitoring. The stimulus monitoring the head movement. This is the pre-mapping procedure near our center. The pre operative language assessment. We use a physio battery of Chinese to assess the language function pre operative and then perform the pre operative training. To reduce the patient's anxiety. This is the local anesthesia. And the decision designs. to do the, the word naming. After, after preserve the functional areas that perform the tumor infection.
So the second project is to establish the functional maps of direct electrical stimulation induced speech arrest and anomia via a multi center re respective uh, study. As we all know, intraoperative direct electrical cortical stimulation refers to the neurosurgeon use the electrical stimulator to directly stimulate the cortex, causing a transient and a reproducible effect on the patient's neural activity and the inducing changes in the patient's behavior. In this way, this technique can provide coral evidence for relationship between the anatomical structure and the function. So it is considered as the gold standard for brain functional mapping. DS started from the early 1970s. Fritsch and Hetzig from Germ Germany were the first to elicit the contralateral limb movement by electrical stimulation of the dog's cerebral cortex. Subsequently, Dr. Ferrier from the UK explored the localization of brain function in experiment experimental animals. And uh, Basro from U United States first proposed the concept of electrical stimulation mapping of the human functional cortex. He stimulates a patient's cortex through a skull defect and uh, successfully induced contraction of the contralateral leg. Around 1910s, German Neurosurgeon Cross was the first to use DS in epilepsy surgery to map the motor cortex in the precentral gyrus. At the same time, Harvey Cushing was the first to localize the sensory cortex in the postcentral gyrus. After that, Dr. Penfield from the MRI Canada began to conduct systematic and large scale studies on the functional mapping of the human brain. Using this technique, Professor Penfield mapped the sensory motor cortex in detail, which is also well known as Penfield sensory motor homunculus. In the following century, the technique was widely used in epilepsy and brain tumor surgery to localize and preserve the language areas. It was also <clears throat> Penfield published the first large scale study of language mapping in 1959 in his landmark book, Speech and Brain Mechanisms. Penfield described the process and the technical details of language mapping, designed, designed a series of classic intraoperative language, language paradigm, which laid a solid foundation for future work on DES language mapping. After Penfield, teams of Professor O'Jamin from, uh, from Washington University and Dr. Berger from United, UCSF, Dr. Dufour from France, and Dr. Chang from UCSF also generated language maps on their native language based on large sample clinical data. For example, the, this work, the, the O'Jamin's work, this work was published in 19. 89, published by OGM and uh, uh, in, the, in the Journal of New Surgery. <clears throat> this work was published in New England, of, uh, New England Journal of Medicine by Sunny and Dr. Berger in 2008. This paper, this work was published in Brain and by Tate and Dufour. And this, this work was published in the Journal of New Surgery also by the, uh, Dr. Chang, UCSF. However, whether the language maps across different languages share the same distribution pattern remains unclear. Furthermore, there are no consensus about the language maps between these studies because the precise distribution may be affected by the potential difference in stimulus, stimulus parameters, mass effects, brain plasticity, normalization methods. That means the, from the intraoperative individual cortex to the standard speed. So there is an urgent need to establish a language map to by integrating the large sample DS datasets around the world. Our team collaborated with professors Michelberg and Edward Chang from UCSF and Professor Dufour from Gui 
really Catholic hospital and carried out an international multi-center retrospective study. We also include the language mapping data collected by Professor Penfield from Montreal Neuro Neurological Institute of Canada between the 1930s and the 1950s and generated the cross-language DS functional maps of the speech cortex with the largest sample size so far. A total of 598 subjects underwent language mapping in the left dominant hemisphere was included, consisting of 1990 subjects from MNI in Canada, whose native language was English and French from Indo European language family. 98 subjects from UCSF in the United States, whose native English was English, <coughs> native language was English. And 155 subjects from TCH of France, whose native language was French. And 255 patients from Huashan Hospital, China, whose native language is Mandarin from, from Sino, Sino-Tibetan language family. All subjects performed the two most commonly used language tasks, number counting and picture naming during stimulation. In the counting task, the patient is asked to count from one to 10 or from one to 50. Speech rest is defined as the complete stop of ongoing number counting without apparent oral, facial, jaw, or tongue movement which is basically an interference of the speech output function. During the picture naming task, the patient is asked to name the objects. Anomia is defined as the stimulation-induced inability to name an object or misnaming, use the wrong word, while still being able to speak the initial words. For example, the, this picture is blah, 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 blah. blah. The, no, the anomia sites represent the semantic or lexical processing cortex. All the positive sides were marked with the st st sterile uh, labels. The interoperative photos were taken to plot the positive sides onto the individual surface postoperatively according to the anatomical landmark. Positive sides from all individuals were aggregated into a standard brain template we can see that the different centers applied various te templates. For the results on the uh, hand draw template from MNI, we labeled the positive size to MNI 152 template according to the anatomical landmarks. And the UCSF team used the calling 27 template. And we used the STM normalization algorithm to project the positive size to the MI template. Finally, all sites were labeled with reference to the anatomical atlas on the right. Figure A to D showed the distribution of speech rest size in four medical centers. And in figure E, we uh, respectively present their percentage of speech rest size in various regions. We can see that in each medical center, the ventral precentral gyrus has the highest proportion of speech rest. You can see it here. While the proportion in the pars opercularis and the pars tri triangularis are relatively low. Finally, the correlation analysis show that the speech rest size have similar distribution patterns across the four centers. Then we merged the data from four centers and produced the density map and the cluster maps based on the cluster analysis. The bar graph on the left panel shows the density distribution of speech rest size on various brain regions in each cluster. The density map shows that the peak point of the speech rest is located in the ventral part of the precentral gyrus rather than in the, rather than the, the traditional Brock's area. The cluster map shows that the speech rest can be divided into four clusters. Cluster one indicates the ventral precentral gyrus, the, the adjacent ventral postcentral gyrus, and the broadcast area. Cluster two mainly covered the 
dorsal precentral gyrus and the posterior middle frontal gyrus. Cluster three covers the supplementary motor area, and uh, the cluster four covers the cortex at the temporal parietal junction. This is the spatial rest distribution. And the same method was also applied to the anomia sites. A total of 423 anomia sites from four centers were included for, for the analysis. They were mainly distributed in the inferior frontal gyrus and the posterior temporal lobe. After combining all the sites from different centers, this anomia sites can be divided into two clusters. The posterior cluster was located in the posterior superior temporal gyrus. The cluster covered the posterior STG and the middle temporal gyrus, as well as the inferior portions of the superior mar supra marginal gyrus. The second cluster centered at the pars triangularis. This is the center of the anterior cluster. This cluster mainly contained sites from the pars opercularis Pars triangularis and the posterior middle frontal gyrus. Finally, we merged the speech rest anomia functional maps and produced the cross language minimal common language cortex. In addition, this is the minimal common language cortex from the DS. And in addition, our results reported a gradual transitional pattern from the speech output function to a higher level lexical semantic processing in the direction from the ventral premotor cortex to the pi past triangularis of Brock's area. This pattern fits well to the modern understanding of parcellation of the arterial language regions, where the poster, posterior part of the Brock's areas and the ventral premotor cortex have predominantly motor functions, while the anterior part of the Brock's areas, that means the pars, pars triangularis, have more prefrontal, prefrontal functions like the cognitive functions. This is the short video introducing the sec second project. Language is a high level cognitive function unique to human beings and also the carrier of human civilization. However, the scientific question of how is the human language cortex distributed remains unsolved. Direct electrical stimulation, DES, has been utilized to map and preserve language cortex during neurosurgery for about a century. Professor Jin Song Wu's team from Huashan Hospital led an international multicenter retrospective study to construct the functional map of human language cortex using direct electrical stimulation. Two most commonly used language paradigms were performed. One is continuous counting task. Speech arrest is One, defined two. as the stimulation induced complete stop of counting without any obvious oral, Three, facial, four. or jaw, or tongue movements, which is the interference of speech output function. Another is picture naming this task. Is Anomia is defined as the stimulation induced inability to name the object this in the picture or misnaming using the wrong word which is the interference of semantic lexical processing. Four DES cohorts were included. HSH cohort from China, UCSF cohort from the United States, GCH cohort from France, and MNI cohort from Canada, where three indigenous languages, English, French, or Mandarin are spoken. After integrating all the data to a common anatomical atlas, Speech arrest sites could be divided into four clusters, with the peak point located in the ventral precentral gyrus. The anomia sites could be divided into two clusters with two peaks. One peak in the posterior superior temporal gyrus, and another peak in the pars triangularis. By merging the speech arrest and anomia functional maps, this study is the first to build a cross-language human minimal common language cortex. This work not only provides language mapping and preservation strategies for neurosurgery, but also has scientific value for our understanding of how human language is organized and produced. In addition, 
this work suggests that although human civilization has undergone relatively isolated evolution, the underlying neural mechanisms of language are still the same. This is the, <coughs> the, third, uh, the third project. Since the speech arrest mainly located in the ventral precentral gyrus, we want to ask what is the stru structural basis of the speech arrest? So we investigate the relationship between language pathways at the speech arrest sites. Previous study have shown that the accurate fasciculus and the third branch of the superior longitudinal fasciculus are the major white matter pathways subserving the human speech production. We wonder how consistent of the frontal cortical endpoints of the AF and the SF3 are with the speech arrest sites. Three RI masks were used to extract the EF and uh, SAF. So RI1 was defined around the posterior temporal lobe on an axle view, which capture the EF fibrous bundles going into the temporal region. region. RI3 was defined on the sagittal view around the inferior parietal lobe, including the and, and angular gyrus and the supramarginal gyrus. On the selection of R2 pre to preserve the frontal termination uh, as possible, we encircled R2 around the whole ventral precentral gyrus, middle frontal gyrus, and the inferior frontal gyrus on the sagittal view. We first reconstructed the fibers in 192 healthy, healthy Chinese participants. The results show that the endpoints of both AF and SL3 were mainly located in the ventral precentral gyrus, not the broadcast area. And look at, the, we, can, we can see the endpoints of AF. Most of the AF project the precentral gyrus and some, some parts of the AF also project to the parts uh, of ocularius. And the SF, most of the uh, SL uh, projects the pre ventral precentral gyrus and the some part of, to the post central gyrus. To explore the consistency between the frontal endpoints at AF of AF and SF and the speech rest sites, we retrospectively analyzed 77 glioma cases underwent intraoperative language mapping in the left lateral frontal cortex at Huachan Hospital. And in order to exclude the influence of the mass effect and edema as much as possible, we further excluded the cases where the region of interest were involved by tumor or peritumoral edema. A total of 26 final cases were included in this in the further analysis. At the individual level, each patient's intraoperative positive sites were marked on the cerebral surface by the label which were used to restore the location of speech rest sites on the 3D cere cerebral surface post-optively. On the other hand, based on the preoperative DTI data, we can track the fibers of AF and SF3 as we reconstruct the cortical endpoints. Then considering the spatial relationship of DS mapping was about one centimeter, we use a one centimeter square grid diagram to count the spatial distribution of speech rest sites and the frontal endpoints of the fibers. We can see in the figure that the blue grid are the positive, positive grids for speech rest. The red and green grids are the positive grids of AF and SF3 endpoints respectively. And the white grids are the cor corresponding negative grids Finally, we poured the data across all grades at the group level for, for consistency testing and sensitivity and specificity analysis. And here is the result. Figure one is the bar graph of consistency coefficients for predicting speech arrests. The results showed that the frontal endpoints of AF and SF3 and their complex that means uh, combine the, the EF and SF3 were all moderately, moderately and uh, all highly consistent with the speech rest size. 
which was statistically significant. Figure B on the right is the bar graph of the sensitivity and the specificity for predicting speech arrest sites. The results show that the frontal endpoints of AFS F3 and their complex have a high sensitivity and specificity in predicting speech arrest sites. We can see that the the sensitivity, all of the sensitivity of the EFSF3 and the, the complex, all of the sensitivity are above 80, 85. And also the specificity also is relatively high. It's about more, it's more, more than 70%. From this, we propose that the frontal endpoints of EFSF3 might be good predictors in predicting of the predicting the speech output cortex. That means the endpoint of the AF and SF3 could be a good method to locate the speech output areas before operation. To summarize, we can draw the following four conclusion. The ventral precentral gyrus plays a critical role in the speech output circuit. And uh, the second, se the second uh, conclusion is Posterior SDG and post triangularis are thematic lexical processing related regions. The pattern, the third is the pattern of language maps were consistent across the three languages, which provide evidence for common networks across language. Four, frontal endpoints of EF and SF3 are mainly located in the ventral precentral gyrus rather than in the proximal area. And the distribution of these endpoints might be good predictors in predicting the speech, speech output cortex. I wish to thank the clinical team of glioma surgery division and the awake anesthesia team in Huaxian Hospital and the scientific research team of our, our lab. And I would like to especially thank the professor, uh, Dr. Berger, Professor uh, Chang and uh, Professor Dufour and their, for their academic support and technical guidance on awake surgery and the brain mapping. Thank you all, thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Du for this brilliant uh, speech. Is there any questions from the audience? Uh, probably uh, I may start the question first, Professor. Uh, professor, you, you thought that uh, the estimation you want to three milli ampere. Uh, which are lower than uh, what have been uh, prescribed by other center. Uh, with that, would you fail to identify or cause, I mean, uh, 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 causing a, a speech array, for example? Why do, don't you go higher uh, milliampere, uh, say, to 5 milliampere? Uh, any reason for that? Sorry, sorry, my network is not a stable. I can't hear your question. Sorry. I, I mean, your maximum stimulation, you show that you are prescribing one to three mPa, and when they, some go up to five milliampere, uh, would you uh, fail to cause a, a speech arrest with, with that low uh, milliampere, Professor? And any reason for that? I think Dr. Liu is asking about the uh, intensity of the bipolar stimulator you are using to cause the uh, speech arrest. And he noticed oh. that you are using up to five milliampers. Uh, mm. Am I right? And uh, he's asking about the. Uh, uh, are you are you do you uh, uh, how often or the sensitivity of inducing a speech arrest is one hundred percent or something? How how do you adjust the intensity of the 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 bipolar stimulator during the initial testing of this direct cortical stimulation? Yeah, yes, sorry. Uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. Yes, it is uh, 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 always the, 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 the first step for the, for the brain mapping, yeah. So uh, we usually start the, the, the bipolar intensity uh, from the one point. Uh, now we, we show that uh, in, in this paper is one, two, three. I remember that. Actually, sometimes uh, we, we, we start the, from the one, one uh, MA or, or 1.5 MA sometimes. And this, at first we usually to, to, to stimulate the motor cortex at first. 
if the the the, the intensity can elicit the movement of the, for example, the the hand motor area, hand motor movement, or the face face or tip or tongue movement. Also, I, I will I will set the 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 intensity at the the start intensity. And then I will, if we can't elicit the, the movement, I will increase increase the intensity uh, by by zero point five mini and uh, usually almost uh, about I, I think about eighty percent of patient could elicit the spatial rest at uh, uh, one point five mini That but sometimes if the if the tumor invasive if the tumor invasive invade the 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 uh, the language cortex for example the special arrest area maybe the intensity should increase to about two or three sometimes i uh, we also we also look at the the penfield's work about one uh, 100 years ago 100 years ago uh, the the usually use a very high high intensity uh, I think uh, it's very high for the epilepsy patient, uh, but uh, there's some difference uh, between uh, the the Penfield's uh, uh, stimulators and now the modern stimulator. Because now we use the stimulator, the OGM stimulators now, and uh, uh, it's different from the uh, Penfield's stimulator. Uh, I'm not sure what's the uh, uh, I didn't I. I, I'm not sure what means the tyrant or stimulator in MRI. Uh, I, ho I hope I have the opportunity to visit MRI to, <laughs> to look at the, 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 the stimulator, that kind. Of, what's, what's the difference between the modern stimulator and the previous stimulators? Yeah. I have another question, Professor. If you yeah. show that the, the speech area actually is quite wide, uh, uh, it can be in frontal, it can be in a temporal and a brighter look. Uh, uh, may I know that? So it, what would you suggest if a patient with a glioma, uh, do you do a large cranotomy because of a, a wide uh, diffusion of speech area or how you strategize your surgery, Professor? You mean the temporal? temporal uh... yeah. yeah, because you have shown that uh, the the wide distribution of speech area, it can be anywhere uh, in multiple area of the brain. Uh, uh, so would you do a blush cranotomy uh, just to identify those areas uh, before no, no, you no. exercise the tumor? Yeah, yes, I know. We, we don't uh, enlarge the craniotomy for the... Yes, the, you mean the speech rest is very, very large and uh, sometimes also uh, the temporal temporal lobe also can find some spatial rest area. That's the patient for the the glioma. Uh, I think uh, the the temporal or or parietal lobe glioma. So for the uh, for the patient for 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 the glioma patient, we usually uh, uh, not uh, not uh, uh, to 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 we we don't we don't uh, uh, um, enlarge the craniotomy. Yeah, yeah. Following the question, uh, it, it is our experience in Taiwan Chang'an Memorial Hospital is similar mm. to what uh, Hua Shan does uh, uh, in, in regarding the parameters of using the uh, Ultraman stimulator. We also increase from uh, two to two point five mini amperes, and if the tumor is uh, invading the language area or is uh, larger or has prominent uh, brain edema, maybe we need four mini impulse to induce speech arrest to, to first induce a positive area for further uh, cortical stimulation. And we also do, actually there are two kinds of uh, awake craniotomy bone flap design uh, uh, concepts. One is negative mapping concepts, uh, which uh, they, they think that um, uh, you only have to expose what you need to resect the glioma, even if it would only induce some negative mapping. And another, I think uh, we and Hua Shan and Dufo uh, have also visit in 2019. Uh, we are using a positive mapping concept, which means we, some, we always create a, a regular frontal temporal bone flap 
to expose a uh, 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 ventral premotor region to induce a positive uh, remapping so that we can uh, conduct further uh, resection. You think so, Dr. Du? Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> you, you, you answered the question for me. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes, usually we, uh, we, we don't, uh, we don't uh, suggest using the negative mapping. We, we like uh, to use uh, a little bit. Uh, sometimes because for the glioma surgery, we like to do the, to perform the supra total resection. So yeah. we like to do a little bit uh, uh, large, a little bit large than the glioma, than the yes, craniotomy. So we like uh, to at first uh, to look at like, the precentral and the speech areas, and uh, we can perform the tumor resection as much as much as possible to remove uh, more uh, surround, uh, more more tumors surrounding the glioma. Yeah. Any question, uh, Prof Kuma? You have any question for our speaker? Um, no, I just wanted to ask one thing uh, uh, from the professor. Uh, you uh, any special uh, techniques um, uh, uh, for angular gyrus tumors, like which are specifically in the comprehension uh, uh, area? Uh, is it you? How do you how do you actually map the tumors which are not actually in the in the motor component, just in the angular region? Uh, is there any specific tool? Is there any specific technique? Please let us know. You mean the aggregate, uh, <laughs> aggregate yes. uh, uh, gyrus tumor? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, I think sometimes we usually uh, to perform the picture naming because the okay. aggregate gyrus was uh, 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 is close is near to the posterior STG and the middle STG. And also it is very close to the, uh, 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 I mean, the uh, warp generation, uh, warp generation uh, uh, VWFA, VWFA, viral world formation areas that's located in the posterior part of the inferior temporal gyrus. So the aggregate gyrus was was close to this area. We need to design our task uh, considering these areas. For example, the picture naming, the word reading is also very important for the for this that area. area. And uh, sometimes we also perform the viral, viral field or, or, or the neg neglect. Uh, I mean that the, we, we ask the patient to, to, to see a, a line and to find the middle of the line to see that uh, it is uh, to, to assess the inferior parietal lobe. Uh, it is the spatial, viral spatial function. Yeah, but uh, actually mm, there's not so, so many gliomas, glioma located in the angular gyrus, I think. Most of the, most of the glioma located in the frontal temporal and the insula. Thank you, thank you for your question. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Lu. I think this is a very important question and also an interesting view to, to resect this kind of uh, glioma in angular gyrus. And uh, 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 Professor Lu mentioned about the picture naming and uh, uh, reading and uh, uh, the maybe neglect. Uh, there are uh, several tasks we can use in the intraoperative intra suit. Uh, in order to identify the, the deficit, what we can cause to these patients. And for, uh, uh, for the comprehension, um, actually we, have, we, we, uh, we usually do several uh, tasks uh, as uh, picture naming, uh, um, um, PPTT to detect the semantic function. So during this kind of uh, detection, we can uh, continuously communicate with the patients so that during the stimulation of the cortical region, um, maybe sometimes you, you, you find that the patient is not concentrating. Uh, it, it, it should be uh, noticed that maybe this is uh, including the, is involving the comprehension 
region because actually uh, if you are not uh, very focused on the on the task you, you might not understand or, or not able to answer uh, the right question uh, the right answer uh, but uh, regarding uh, during the tumor resection always we we initiate with the tumor then we go to the boundary so uh, the comprehension uh, in our experience I think the comprehension is is uh, the boundary of the comprehension is the five meter bundle, uh, like the, the arcuate fasciculus or SF3. Uh, so my question to Dr. Lu is that, uh, how, how do you define the five meter bundle in the deep region uh, regarding the glioma resection of frontal temporal or even parietal insular region? Uh, what's your experiences on this? Oh, sometimes we use the, uh, actually, we uh, for all the patients, we will reconstruct all the fibers before operation and uh, import them to the navigation. This is the first step. And mm -hmm. then uh, during the operation, uh, sometimes we, uh, we use the subcortical mapping. But uh, mm, I don't, I have no more, uh, but uh, uh, the subcortical mapping is not uh, I have more, have no many, not many uh, experience about the subcortical mapping. Do, do you have some subcortical mapping about the, these fibers? I know that Dufour performed a lot of cases uh, using to, uh, to, to do the, the, the subcortical mapping work. But in our center, sometimes we use it, but uh, actually um, it's, we, we usually define the fi fibers uh, according to the anatomy called landmarks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's uh, in line with uh, uh, my visit in 2018. I saw your team to do a first resection, then intraoperatory MRI, then a second resection according to the anatomical landmark. So uh, in in our experience, we use bipolar stimulator uh, like the Bo use in France. And uh, sometimes, yeah, our experience is that we, our subcortical mapping is not as successful as Dr. Jufo. Uh, I think this limitation is the, our knowledge of the uh, fiber tract is not as well as he does. But after several experience, uh, several years of experiences, I think uh, now I actually in the surgery, I, I can find some fibers. Uh, uh, especially the, the language fibers or uh, motor fibers, uh, which is very, because these kinds of fibers, when you stimulate, you can see a very significant and uh, repeated uh, response of the patients. So if the patients can uh, cooperate well, then I think the subcortical mapping can actually define the true uh, functional boundary of these patients. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's very good. It's very. Uh, we will try it. We will try it in the future work. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. And also, I I think that actually, I think most of the patients, even we didn't perform the subcortical mapping, most of the patients will recover very well after operation. I'm not, I'm not sure uh, whether that's because maybe that's because of the brain plasticity of the language, maybe language plasticity is very strong, yeah, uh, maybe, but uh, mm, subcortical mapping is our future work, I think. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to uh, Professor Lu for a very nice presentation and a great discussion uh, chaired by uh, Professor Chen. So now we reach at the end of the, our webinar today. On, on behalf of the Education uh, Committee of the SNS and Press Student, Professor Yokato, I would like to thank both speakers of today, Professor Ashikuma and Professor Jung Feng Lu, as well as our Chair, Professor Timo Krings, and also Professor Ku Ting Cheng uh, Chen for the time and support for the SNS webinar. I would like also express my sincere gratitude to, to Professor Zubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. So until we meet again uh, next Wednesday, it's bye-bye from all of us. Thank you for joining. Thank you.